So uh, your textbook is a good place to uh, <laughs> look at if we, uh, to the level of detail that we are we are going to cover um, the, the on the things that relate to fusion and um, <laughs> and 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 I'll try to do a more traditional lecture. Sorry, the hesitation you are seeing from me is that I think I realized a few minutes before this, the start of this class that I have never actually lectured on fusion. So I have some rough outline of what I want to talk about when it relates to fusion. I almost want to say that your textbook, frankly, has more detail, um, more detail than, than I have memorized, especially this uh, proton proton chain uh, describing the kind of the react fusion reaction that takes place inside the star. And I think the form in which the, the, um, the lecture here will be most beneficial is uh, where I lay out some of the, the structure, skeletal things, um, kind of the core concepts to be aware of when you're thinking of fusion. And then for the more details, um, I'll kind of scroll through the textbook section, adding some comments. I think that'll be uh, more useful than anything else. Uh, that I can do in the next 20 minutes or so. So let me actually do more of the traditional lecture. This is kind of um, what I would do in face-to-face -face class, <laughs> except uh, we are online and instead of whiteboard, I'm using this OneNote screen with my uh, Wacom tablet. So, um, so this is what I might have uh, mentioned if I had like five or 10 minutes in back in spring 2018. So, so, um, so I, I think uh, when you, as you are uh, hearing this lecture and um, I think it makes the most sense if you imagine this coming in place, um, I think some place, I guess, right after nuclear fusion. So if you um, if you hear me talk about nuclear fusion, you will uh, see me talk about uh, see me contrast nuclear fusion with um, as a draw a contrast between um, a spontaneous process, spontaneous decay process that you will have seen up to this point and a kind of a stimulated process. That's the description of the chain reaction there. So, so hopefully either you just saw this or I'd like you to have, to imagine having watched this lecture, a description of the nuclear fission, the fission chain reaction, and how all of this uh, takes uh, the setup. And do I actually say, uh, Oh, why people are not? Oh, basic theories of the material you're working with, so that you know oh. when things get dangerous. Yeah. Um, so that was so, the story related from the Manhattan Project, I think, by uh, in as in Feynman's related. So, so that's uh, what I want you to imagine, having uh, just uh, listened or just uh, heard. Uh, Oh, yeah, so, so coming after that is this uh, lecture on uh, nuclear fusion. So, um, so we did that uh, kind, kind of an intro. When we are talking about nuclear fusion, uh, we are in some sense talking of an opposite process from fission. So, um, so as we are considering nuclear fusion, I do think it is good to con contrast it with the nuclear fission that you have seen. In the case of fission, the kind of reaction that you have seen is, um, is well, fission or a separation of a heavy atomic nucleus. So, um, 
so the example that you see in the textbook and in the lecture is a fission of uranium um, 235 isotope and the details of or the um, the kind of the structure of the atomic nucleus that allows a fission to occur it's quite specific to a particular atomic a particular isotope so uh, take uranium for example uranium 235 is fissile it undergoes a fission uh, it's a fissile and uranium 238 it's uh, not fissile and at least uh, at our level of covering this, um, I'm not going to give you an explanation why one is a fissile and one is not, other than to simply state that if you have an uranium-235 and you uh, impact it with a neutron, then after collision with a neutron, this splits into daughter nuclei, uh, most commonly into two roughly equal masses, but not always. The daughter nuclei, it splits into kind of depends. And uh, that's what happens with uranium-235. With uh, uranium-238, uh, if a neutron impacts it, it doesn't split. It, um, it actually turns uh, first into uranium-239. So that's uranium with the uh, additional <laughs> neutron. This is unstable and it'll decay. Um, it'll decay by beta decay. And as it decays, it's going to turn into plutonium. Oh, I, I don't remember the atomic symbol for plutonium. It might be PT. Um, don't call me on that. It turns into plutonium 239. And actually, two, plutonium 239 is a fissile. And uh, that's one of the ways of uh, building nuclear fission bomb. So, but this is the process that occurs in fission. And one of the things that tells you that. Um, Fission is a kind of a process that can happen is when you look at the atomic masses. So you look at the combined mass of the neutron and uranium-235. Th that'll give you the rest energy that you are starting with. And you look at the potential decay product of the daughter nuclei. Then you will see that the, the rest final rest energy here is it's less than the rest energy that you are starting out with. So from that rough high level 30,000 feet uh, view, you can see that um, um, when, you have, when you have a neutron plus this heavy atomic nucleus, that um, it's more energetically favorable for this to split into smaller, lighter, lighter nuclei. So, um, and the details of the process that occurs, that's, uh, <laughs> that's the part that I'm saying. It kind of depends on the particular isotope. We are not going to go too much into that detail. Um, but at this, uh, again, 30,000 feet view, you can see that it's uh, just looking at rough numbers that, um, that it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's a more, so the, the process, that occurs from the left-hand side to the right-hand side is energetically favorable. And in our, pre in our previous discussion about fission, we ended up talking about how this is a kind of a stimulated process, that um, this is activated by collision of neutron with a fissile material. And, um, in fact, uh, controlling fission reaction has a lot with um, controlling uh, the the neutron economy. Uh, it or um, uh, so I guess the best way to phrase that in a way that's not misleading is uh, controlled by uh, or controlled through neutrons. Uh, neutron. Uh, I'll just uh, say neutrons. And in fact, you see that. Uh, you see that aspect of that when you read about nuclear reactors. So in nuclear reactors, you have uh, something called uh, moderators. 
And, uh, and I think moderators are something that you don't have in a nuclear bomb, but in a peaceful nuclear reactor, you have something called the moderator and the role of moderators are really to uh, control the neutrons. The neutrons that, so in the fission reaction produces their own neutrons and these um, neutrons that come out of these reactions are generally high energy neutrons and high energy neutrons are less likely to react with another fissile material to produce a fission, a fission reaction. So the role of moderator is to actually sl slow down these neutrons, make the reaction more likely to happen. And um, I think uh, way back in, is it 2013 uh, with the, the last uh, well publicized the nuclear disaster in Fukushima? Uh, one of the um, one of the things that you might have um, heard about w w was the was was the the water in the the nuclear reactor. The water in the nuclear reactors uh, serve uh, in some designs uh, serve a dual role as as the neutron moderators which facilitate these nuclear fission reactions to occur, and also as a coolant. And um, at some point when the pumps weren't working because the electricity was out and water wasn't circulating and all of that. So, so that's a fission. Those are the details that we uh, consider when we are thinking about fission. And when we are thinking of nuclear fusion, the kind of the details that we are concerned with, it actually changes quite a bit. It, um, the things that we worry about when we were thinking about fission, a lot of that kind of um, doesn't matter anymore and new considerations come into place because so, you, you know, in trying to get fission reaction to happen, a lot of that actually really deals with the neutrons. That's uh, the key number one thing that you think through. Uh, whether a material is a fissile or not, it really has to do the way, hey, how many neutrons does it produce in this uh, reaction that it splits it apart? If it produces too few neutrons, then it's not fissile. If it produces enough neutrons, then it is fissile. With a nuclear fusion reaction, um, that doesn't quite, um, it, it, it's not the primary concern. <laughs> and so, so um, the nuclear fusion reaction is kind of what it sounds like at the fundamental level. It involves um, uh, nuclei or the atomic nucleus, um, uh, fusing, uh, coming together and becoming a heavier, uh, heavier isotope. And as you think this is through, I think you will see that there has to be more um, steps involved here because, you know, imagine the simplest possible fusion process. So the simplest possible fusion process would be a hydrogen uh, fusing with another hydrogen and then turning into what? Uh, helium-2, that hopefully if you are uh, paying attention through this uh, chapter 10, that uh, that's not quite right because helium-2 is not one of the uh, isotopes of helium that you are familiar with. You have heard of helium-3 and you have heard of helium-4, but helium-2 is not, um, it, it's not one of the is stable isotopes of helium. And um, in fact, one of the things that you have seen leading up to here is the, um, uh, the, the island of uh, nuclear stability. So just to briefly sketch the chart, what it looked like was if you plot for every stable or long enough lived uh, isotopes, if you plot the number of neutrons and number of protons, the kind of the stable isotopes, they more or less follow a straight line until you get to the more heavier nuclei where there are more neutrons than protons. So for if you are thinking of forming uh, isot these heavier isotopes here from these lighter isotopes here, then um, starting with the hydrogen, which only has a proton, 
at some point you have to turn some of these protons into neutrons. And, and so this is the more detailed portion of the process that I wouldn't trust myself to remember, mainly because I'm not an astrophysicist and I don't think about these particular processes too often, but your textbook does uh, mention this in the portion where it talks about the nuclear fusion reactions that take place in the sun. That's the, uh, what they call the proton-proton chain and this is describing how, starting with hydrogen, the most common, most abundant building block in the building block of normal matter in the universe, you would get to the next heavier um, atomic isotope, uh, next heavier isotope to helium. So it's uh, describing this chain, uh, proton, proton, it forms this, uh, and, and I guess, yeah, helium-2 never really forms. So in this process, one of the protons become a neutron, uh, forming a deuterium. And as the one of the proton becomes a neutron, charge is conserved, so it produces an electron, uh, not electron, produces a positron <laughs> and, um, and it produces this one more particle that we are actually a bit a week early to talk about, neutrino, which I kind of uh, hinted at, at the very last lecture in this chapter, but we will save the introduction of neutrino until next week, but it does that. And this positron, it'll annihilate with electron within the sun and go away, turn into gamma rays. All of that is for next week. We haven't started talking about antiparticles yet. But so hydrogen plus hydrogen becomes deuterium plus some other things. And hydrogen plus deuterium now becomes helium-3. And uh, helium-3 is not the, the most common um, isotope of helium when you look into the sun. So this uh, uh, helium-3 and helium-3 combines and uh, becomes a helium-4 plus some spare protons. And, and these will go through another, this proton-proton chain to make more helium-4. And all this process is uh, basically uh, adding up to how this is describing how hydrogen is fused into helium in the sun or any star that we imagine. Um, sun is the nearest star that we know, and it's the most closely studied star. Uh, and, and we think based on astronomical observation, this is the pro uh, primary process that occurs in, uh, in all the stars, uh, all the new stars. Uh, and as you are thinking about this process, there are really the two, um, two biggest thing to consider, which are the barriers that need to be overcome. Um, so one is, so, so far we've been drawing diagrams, but I want you to really remember that when we describe hydrogen or technically proton in these interactions, we are talking about two we are talking about two positive charges that have to somehow have to come near each other to in the they that somehow have to come near each other to the point where nuclear forces become appreciable and as we will talk in detail next week nuclear force is a short range of force it's um, it, it, the uh, nuclear, the strong nuclear force range. We be, it, it has uh, somewhere around the range of 10 to minus 15 meter. That's about the size of the atomic nucleus. Outside of that, it starts to become negligible. So these two proton, um, protons have to come 10 to the minus 15 meter of each other before the Nuclear um, nuclear forces can take over the the electromagnetic force that governs most of the other interactions that we we are familiar with, and and what I want you to consider and realize is that 
the courtroom report, these are, these are both the positive charges. Um, it's just the way things are arranged that um, both of the particles that would uh, participate in this nuclear reaction, they both happen to have positive charges. And, um, and until, they are, until they come close enough to come close enough to the range where nuclear force can take over, um, these two positive charges are actually experiencing Coulomb repulsion. So if you had two protons simply near each other, um, they, 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 the, the most common tendency is for them to simply repel each other and be as far away from each other as they can and no nuclear fusion reaction occurs. So there has to be something in the setup that overcomes this Coulomb uh, repulsion. And, and, and that leads to the, uh, the first of the considerations that is necessary for nuclear fusion to occur. And what it is, is, so just leading from here, for nuclear fusion to occur, the fusion fuel, which in this case is hydrogen, but it can be other material too, the fusion fuel needs to have high kinetic energy. Because you can almost uh, think of this uh, classically. Uh, you can think of these as uh, two positive charges that are moving towards each other. You need to get them to close enough distance where nuclear reaction can take over and allow fusion to occur. And um, uh, so as they come close to each other, they're going to slow down. And for them to uh, come close enough before they are turned around and repelled back, uh, for them to come close enough, they have to start out with a high enough kinetic energy so that before the classical turning point, they are close enough so that fusion can occur. And in the more so high kinetic energy, if you are looking at the, those each individual microscopic interactions, or from the macroscopic perspective, you would say they need to have high temperature. So that's a, one of the conditions that needed to be. And as you continue to look at this reaction carefully, what I think you will see is that um, this reaction describes a fairly unlikely set of circumstances. Um, so for the proton chain that's occurring in the sun, definitely. And um, we can actually cheat or we can help it along by, uh, by for example, providing deuterium. So, um, so, you know, if you are trying to set up the artificial conditions to make the fusion more likely to occur, nothing says that you have to start out with the hydrogen. You can get heavy water, you can <laughs> separate the deuterium, or I guess heavy water already contains the deuterium. So you can actually start out with the deuterium, or actually hydrogen has a, a even heavier isotope tritium that's actually fairly stable. So you can even get tritium and start out with some tritium to help this reaction along. Um, so that, that is possible. And uh, even in that case, what you are looking at is a fairly um, unlikely or rare set of circumstances because it, this always involves repulsion. So if they happen to be coming toward each other with a wrong velocities, as in they're slightly missing the, each other, then, then it's uh, quite easy for them to not come as close as they can kind of miss each other. So there's um, quite of a, a set of circumstances that needed to happen right. You, you could say that the processes that are described here, they are on the whole fairly rare processes especially after the first step, because it, this can't be just a, a hydrogen colliding with uh, any other hydrogen lying around. It has to be colliding one of the deuterium. And here it, you have to find one of the helium-3 that's already formed, make the collide with another helium-3 that's also formed. And so all these are beginning to uh, describe uh, processes that, um, that are rare, or at least on the rarer side. And um, if you need, um, so this is a phrase that you will see me say sometime next week, which is, um, um, it's a saying in particle physics, 
it's saying uh, whatever is not forbidden is mandatory. And it's a reference to the fact that all the rare things that could happen in particle physics, you actually do see them happen all the time. And the way we make those rare processes happen, we kind of guarantee that they happen, is we have a large number of them. We have a large number of incidences, large number of collisions, large quantity of data. And within that large set, even the rare processes are guaranteed to happen sometimes. And really what you need is that, that these things happen often enough. And in terms of kind of material conditions, um, what you need is um, for the, so for the, let me call it less common, less common collision processes to occur. The fusion fuel needs to be at a high density. So these two factors are what's needed for fusion processes to occur, high temperature and high density. And this is the kind of condition that uh, actually met in the in the core of a star like our sun and uh, in fact that's the uh, success of the, the our solar model that describes the um, the nuclear fusion that uh, powers our sun it keeps the sun in a hydrostatic equilibrium the energy that the sun produces it's a uh, no longer coming from gravitational collapse. It's coming from the energy released in this fusion process. And I, I think uh, with some sense of scale for how large the sun is, how much mass there is, I think it's, a, it's, it's easy enough to imagine that in the core that it would be at high enough density that the hydrogen atoms that are in the core are so packed together that it's a, uh, much higher density than anything else we have on the earth now. And, um, and I think even high temperature part is kind of easy to imagine, sometimes kind of through the wrong process, but I think what's important is that, that this is something that happens. Now, it, it's one thing to understand the nuclear processes in the sun, uh, which is, you know, it's a, an accomplishment of its own. And this is uh, something that uh, really helped us understand astrophysics and, um, and actually um, through the solution of what used to be called the solar neutrino problem, um, uh, it helped to add to our understanding of uh, the particle physics as well, because it helped us understand the neutrino, <laughs> the particle we are introducing next to it. Um, so, so there's that, that's one thing. It's something that happens in nature and we have a theory that describes, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and maybe in another comparison to nuclear fission, um, what we are describing with the nuclear fission at least most of the time, this is not something that just happens in nature or it doesn't really happen in nature, at least not anymore. I think there are some locations in, on earth that used to be natural nuclear reactor, not around anymore. This uh, process like this is not something that happens in nature these days. This is a device that we built. And, um, and so far in our description of fusion, we are simply describing something that just happens. <laughs> we don't, um, this is not a process that we are driving. So one of the kind of goal or technology that's been always 20 years away has been a generation of energy through nuclear fusion. And in one sense, that's right. I think your textbook mentions it somewhere. It, it, Talk, should talk about um, yeah fusion reactor, so um, so fusion chain believed to be most practical for using a nuclear fusion reactor. And here, you know, we are kind of cheating. Start out with the deuterium instead of hydrogen, so that we have a shorter chain. And people have been doing research on devices like this. Uh, I think ITER is uh, I think ITER is the name of the 
collaboration that does work on this. This is a kind of a confinement thing, uh, and and um, and the goal of a device like this is really to produce these conditions in a controllable manner. They need to produce. They need to put together these um, light isotopes where fusion is more energy energetically favorable to occur. We need to put them at high temperature, at high enough density, so that uh, fusion occurs. And um, the challenge here is that no physical material can be used to, to actually confine the material because these temperatures are so high that any uh, potential container will just melt. Uh, so they, they use a, uh, electromagnetic trap. I think they uh, talk about something about very difficult problem, high temperatures are needed. Uh, uh, example. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they're not going into detail. The kind of confinement that they, um, so they use magnetic fields uh, because fields can withstand any temperature. Um, and the short story here is that a lot of work is still being done. Um, I, there's a work being done at National Ignition Facility. I think it, that's a Lawrence Livermore Laboratory that um, they do fusion uh, research there. And they can cause a fusion to occur. The problem is that um, it takes more energy to uh, ca cause the fusion reaction to occur. Um, than to actually uh, compare to the amount of energy they get out of the fusion reaction, they put in more energy. So it's not actually on net producing any energy. Now, there's one way in which uh, we have been able to harness this uh, fusion reaction in a practical way. And this is kind of the story of technology, which is um, the first place where they get used is for, um, it's for war because, um, in fact, a lot of the uh, a lot of the fission research was driven by the need during the World War II, <laughs> and a lot of the funding for the nuclear fusion research has come through the time of Cold War when United States was competing with the Soviet Union on who's gonna build the biggest bomb. <laughs> and, um, and that's what this uh, um, section is uh, describing. That, um, so the fission bomb, the atomic bomb, has a limit to how much of an yield you can get. Because uh, as you heard me describe in the lecture on the nuclear fission, it's about um, bringing two subcritical masses together quickly to make a critical mass, and then the critical mass then blows up. So there's a kind of a theory, uh, actual physical limit to how big of a pieces that you can bring together and then have a bomb go off. So if you are only relying on nuclear fission, there's a maximum amount of explosive power that you will reach. And um, at some point the scientists who worked on the, who are working on the atomic bomb realized that using the, using the explosive release of energy of the fission bomb, they can actually achieve these conditions uh, and in a very short time scale. And by achieving these conditions in a very short time scale in a fusion fuel, they can actually ignite fusion reaction. And, uh, and that's a, what's called a hydrogen bomb. So it's called a hydrogen bomb because the, so the hydrogen bombs contain fission bomb in it and the fission reaction is uh, used to trigger the fusion uh, push, fusion component of it. And once you trigger the fusion component, then, uh, then the, the <laughs> It's a kind of it's it's a self-sustaining reaction at least until it burns through the the deuterium and tritium fuel that's within the bomb. So um, and I, so I think uh, sorry I've been talking about this a while. Um, <laughs> again, sorry this is my first time lecturing on fusion. I need to kind of organize my thoughts better on what I want to talk about. For those of you more interested in reading about it, I will just to say um, point you to one scientist. So. Robert Oppenheimer was the, he was the project lead of the Manhattan Project that produced the fission bomb. 
And with all, like with a lot of physicists who worked on the atomic bomb, he, uh, he really regretted working on that <laughs> weapon of mass destruction. And, um, and um, he, Oppenheimer, Einstein, maybe Feynman, uh, they, they all later on um, really regretted uh, working on the <laughs> A-bomb. And I don't think he really worked on the hydrogen bomb for that reason. Um, a lot of these physicists, them working on that mass, weapon of mass destruction. So, you know, during the World War II, they were fighting the literal Nazis and um, it's kind of lesser of two evils still. Um, there's <laughs> one physicist who was, uh, central in the development of the hydrogen bomb, who wasn't Robert Oppenheimer, is uh, John Wheeler. He's the, um, yeah, I was searching it up before. Um, I remember reading about him. I can't quite remember the source that I was actually reading before, but he's the, um, he's the, he should be the wait, father of, eh, I don't know, maybe he's not called the father of a hydrogen bomb, but he's the central figure in um, in working on the hydrogen bomb. He, um, I, I think he continued to uh, work on uh, this and um, yeah. So, or no, sorry, I'm confusing Wheeler with the Teller. Sorry, Teller is actually the, <laughs> not the best historian, uh, not that Teller. Uh, what was Teller's first name? Um, Edward Teller, yeah. Edward Teller is, I think he is the father of the hydrogen bomb. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, yeah, he, I think Teller was actually enthusiastic about work, working on the bomb and um, <laughs> Wheeler had uh, his contributions, which is what I'm remembering. Um, and yeah, it, uh, um, Thing, uh, yeah, hydrogen bomb, and yeah, and okay, I think I was somehow mixing up Edward Teller with John Wheeler, and um, I think uh, so. I think the story here is uh, it's good to read it through, um, particularly what the Wikipedia is calling Oppenheimer controversy, and I would just say, physicists are human beings. Uh, they have their shortcomings, and um, <laughs> there are a lot of physicists who are working for Nazis, not in U.S., but, you know, a lot of German physicists who are working for the Nazis, and, um, and it's just uh, good to keep in mind that uh, scientists are not perfect. But um, hydrogen bomb, that's uh, the only practical use of, <laughs> of the fusion reaction that uh, mankind or humankind has been able to control. And um, that's, I think, where we'll leave things off at. Um, I, I think so, so um, yeah. It, yeah, so 